recording. It's good to see you all. I spent some time on the character of Enoch. Muhammad and Zainab probably are uh, familiar with the Quranic prophet Idris, sometimes called Ochnuch. Um, and I will have one Quranic reference. I'm sorry I did not have more. I didn't. I really don't know the Qisas um, al-Anbiya literature as well as I should. I know more of the Quranic material. I'm teaching a Quran course in the spring. I think I'm going to continue working with a lot of the prophet stories from the Quran and see if I can... Um, I know the Quran, the Qisas al-Anbiya stories because I've seen them, I've read them in Ibn Kathir, but I don't have online access and the books that I have are put away and I don't have them. And I know that I can get them. So uh, for today, I didn't have as much. I know there are stories about Ochnoch and about Idris. I have one tafsir, which I have in English on the list. There's a lot of... Yes, Mimi. Um, you know, is this Enoch the same as the Book of Enoch? We will find out, won't we? Okay. So this, I should mention that this is an extension of something from my class on mysticism that I realized I could do a better job at. And part of the reason why I am doing this today is uh, I'm recording it and I will make it available to my mysticism class. So we're gonna start with reading the only material that's in the Bible. And that is uh, Genesis chapter five. Uh, it begins, and Jared lived for 162 years, and he begat Enoch in Hebrew, Hanoch. Vayichi yered acharei holidoat Hanoch, and Jared lived after he had begotten Enoch for 800 years, and he begot sons and daughters, and the days of Jared were 962 years, and he died. Notice that scripture here says, and he died. And then it tells us Hanoch lived 65 years and who his son was, Methuselah. He walked with God after he'd begotten Methuselah. And the Hebrew is Vayit Halech Hanoch. And he walked with God. Uh, the general meaning of Vayit Halech is from Haloch, which means to walk. And it's the everyday word for going and walking in modern Hebrew. And um, I could have used some examples of uh, Hatznei Alechet, for example, to walk humbly with God is a saying from the prophet Micah that's very famous. And there are a few things that comes up and that come up in the commentaries that I have. In any case, what happens? All the days of Hanoch were 365 years. He walked with God, repeated, and ve'enenu, and he was not. The Enenu for our Arabic speaker was Walaisa or Laisahu, or just he is not, because God had taken him. And I have Rashi. The Rashi is in the format that's familiar from the Chabad. I organize the other things to be a little bit easier to see. Um, Rashi died 1105, and he says, Enoch was a righteous man, but he could easily be swayed to return to do evil. Uh, the Midrashic development looks at Adam, Shet, and Nosh, and we could have looked at this material a little bit more closely, uh, but in the time of Enosh, according to the Midrash, the people of the, uh, the world began to do evil, and they began to fall away from divine worship. This was even though Adam and Eve were still alive, and they could have told them that they had seen God walking around in the garden. Whatever we should understand from that. In any case, Enoch was considered by Rashi, and he has sources from Genesis Rabbah, that the Holy Blessed One hastened and took him away and caused him to die. The Hebrew Vehimito, he caused him to die before his time. And Zeu Shashina Katuba Mitato Lichtov Einenu Baulam Limloch Notab. And so scripture changed the wording on account of his demise, and he wrote he was no longer in the world to complete his years. Rashi seems to be taking it from Genesis Rabbah. I did not copy this particular passage, uh, but he argues that this means God took him before his time, 
and he gives you a parallel text from the prophet Ezekiel. Uh, I found the reference in Josephus. I thought it'd be interesting to know Josephus has a parallel text. And interestingly enough, I found a scholar or two who speculate that in this particular case, we may have an ancient survival of the story that the Bible cut out in some of the materials that talk about Enoch, because clearly there's more story than we have in the biblical text. Uh, the for modern Bible historians who talk about J, E, P, and D, the uh, genealogy of Adam that goes to Noah is part of P, the priestly tradition. And they would be very careful about cutting out anything that went contrary to the priestly narrative about what was important. The J material, uh, sometimes used to indicate the first letter of the divine name, Marvin Sweeney, a book who I'm using, uh, an author whose book I'm using in my mysticism class, class calls this Judah, and the late uh, Harold Bloom thought about J as a woman who was working in the circles of David and Solomon, for whatever it's worth. In any case, the J material is a lot more colorful, and we actually have a Hanukkah story, which I'll look at in a moment. In any case, <clears throat> Josephus also says, and he dies. Um, I'm going to ask Zainab and uh, Muhammad to listen carefully to Saji Gaon and tell me whether uh, Enoch died. Olama Asha Hanoch Hams was Satin Sana, Aulid Mitushalach, was Salah Hanoch fi Tatola, Badama Aulada Mitushalach, Salah Mia Sana, Aulad Fia Benin Wabinat, Fasara Jami Amru, Salah Mia Sana, the Hams was Satin Sana, Olama Salah Hanoch fi Tatola. So, did uh, did Hanoch actually die? I I didn't hear the last part, the last two sentences. Oh, okay. Falama salak Hanoch fi taatula tuufia wa kabada hulahu. Tafa means he died. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Tawafa means he died. And it's pretty, it's a, it's a euphemism, but it means he died. Yeah. And that's clearly what it is. Uh, Muhammad, did um, you understand my Arabic? Yes, but again, it, 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 has, it has different meanings because in the Quran, Jesus did not die, but God described the process when he took it. So... Wafa, I don't think it means death in the literal meaning. You get my point? Wafa right. is means that like your time has been done, but right. it doesn't necessarily mean that you die, you, 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 you are dead. Right, so if I wanted to be a little bit more exacting, Sadia who lived in Baghdad died in 942, Sadia seems to say, his time was up to Wufia. He completed his days and God Kababahu, that also God took him or gathered him up, something like that. Yeah, one of my <clears throat> friends also showed me another verse is that it's talking about when God talking about his sleeping in the Quran, Allah So again, so it doesn't it, it doesn't mean like the literal death that you you get killed or something like that. So, and then Allah also like uh, in the Quran says about Idris, and I think he is the same guy we are talking about here. I have the verse later on. So, yeah. yeah. We have, I have the verse later on. So you can see that Sajia, the everyday meaning as Zainab said is that Enoch actually died. But looking at the Quranic meaning and the actual meaning of the, ver of the verb wafa and tawafa, Sajah is not necessarily clear. Uh, Ibn Ezra, and I don't have a translation, mate, says he died. And he gives you a couple of references. 
uh, including interesting references, but I, I'm not going to have the time for it. Uh, I described Chizkuni. Chizkuni is a late medieval commentator as the 7G approach. Uh, why don't you read the translation? I didn't copy the um, Hebrew. Why don't I call this the 7G approach? Anybody? Well, seven seems to be pretty significant. Right, so Hanoch is the seventh in the generations from Adam to Noah, according to the way that they count. And David is mentioned as the seventh son of Yushai, and uh, the seven is special, or there are seven heavens, and there are seven deserts. And some of the versions of this Midrash actually tell you what the seven um, deserts are. And Lake Tiberias is the seven seas. And I did not copy Pirkei to Rebbe Eliezer for you. And the seventh uh, universe and the seven days of creation and so on. Uh, Genesis 4 has a kind of reverse seven that you might find is interesting. This is the generations of Cain. Hello, how are you doing? Uh, Kabil in Arabic for our, um, the, our, ex, uh, our experts. And uh, here, Cain knew his wife, and she conceived, and she bore Hanoch, Enoch. He was building a city, and he called the city after the name of his son, Enoch. We don't have any more information about this, but Rashi seems to say that he named it in memory of his son. I could not find anything about the memory of his son, Enoch, dying before Cain, other than the possibility that as in the story in Genesis 5, Hanoch died early. In any case, let me go down over here. I'm a little bit confused. Uh, is Enoch Idris or is he somebody else? Because now, okay. now he... In, in, Muhammad, in the... I have a very simple answer for you. Yeah. Wallahu a'lam. <laughs> God knows uh, best. Uh, because, because, yeah, because now they say it's like in the seventh generation from Adam, and then now here they are saying he is the son of Cain. Right. So what I can tell you is that sometimes in the Quran and often in the Bible, you have multiple stories, and the stories often line up, but they sometimes don't. So in chapter 4, we have a story of Cain and his descendants. And in chapter 5, we have a story of Seth and his descendants. And modern Bible scholarship suggests that one of them comes from sources that are called P, and one comes from sources that are called J. And that explains why you have the two different stories. You don't really need that. Traditional scholars would say, well, if Cain and Abel, Cain and Seth had their, gave their children similar names. And you know, that's what it is. And if you look at the parallels from the ancient world, we have Mesopotamian and Egyptian and uh, Babylonian and, and Arabic. You know, Tabari gives also all sorts of names of ancient people. And we don't know much about them. Sometimes we only know names. So-and-so was a son of so-and-so was a so -and son of so-and-so. We have lots and lots of names. And sometimes the names seem to be the same. The same person? Probably not, but who knows? And I don't really want to go into it in great detail, but if you're interested, uh, the biblical text calls Hanoch son Irad, spelled with lion, iron rod. And I looked at Josephus. Josephus has a larger, a longer version of this. In the amount of the time that I had to look for the story, I couldn't find very much about this. But Cain traveled over many countries. He, with his wife, he built a city named No, that's in the Bible. And then he had children. He didn't accept his punishment, etc., etc. He aimed to procure every wicked thing. This is not in the Bible. He augmented his household sustenance, he got robbery, he became a leader of men, introduced a change in the way of simplicity, and so on. And then he set boundaries about lands, he built a city, fortified it with walls, compelled his family to come together, 
they called that city Enoch after the name of his eldest son. And then Jared was a name of the son of Enoch. I did not look up the Greek of Josephus. I did look up the um, Septuagint, and that is Gaidad. And I don't know how he got it. But you have a version of the story as well. And I have the Midrash Agadah, uh, which I think suggests that you have the seven, the number seven playing here as well. Uh, Cain built a city, and he called it after his name, Hanoch, uh, because he heard from the Holy Blessed One that his uh, descendants would come to an end after seven generations. So he called the name of the city the name of his son, Hanoch, in order that his name would be remembered forever. And then they quote a verse from the book of Psalms. I don't want to go much into this. I just thought it was interesting. I'm now going back to our main topic, which is Enoch, the son of Jared, not Enoch, the son of Cain. There's a book called Sefer Yashar. It's found in Sepharia. He tells us Jared lived 160 years, uh, 62 years, and it gives it. Then Enoch walked with God. He served the Lord. He despised the evil ways of the sons of man, and his soul was wedded to morality, to wisdom, and understanding. It's a nice thing. But tidbak nefesh hanoch. Tidbak means it, cle it cleaved to it. It was close to it. And musar, da'at, and bina. Musar is uh, morality. It's training. We'll see musar at the very end of my talk today mean something else. And he learned the ways of the Lord. Darche Hashem, and then Vayipared bechachmato et nafsho mivnei haAdam, and his wisdom separated out his soul from humankind, and his soul isolated or became secreted from them for many days. That's what the Sefer Yashar says is the meaning of this. I have no idea what it means. Was he a mystic who practiced uh, some sort of zuhud or? Um, that asceticism or living alone, don't know. Here's Sforno. Uh, Sforno says that he emulated the ways of God by performing acts of loving kindness and issuing rebukes. Now, all of these are the normal material that I would have expected. My students in the mysticism class were interested in the books of Enoch and in the question as to whether Enoch was translated into the heavens and became an angel or had some sort of a role that was greater than a typical role that human beings have. The place I chose to start with this is a Targum. This is called Targum Jonathan. And I should really have said Targum Pseudo Jonathan because Jonathan is the name of the Targumist that's qu quoted in the uh, Talmud for the Targum Targum. Uh, means a translation. Tarjama is a word that our Arabic speakers may know. And Hebrew was like the Egyptians, Targum, not Tarjam. Um, in any case, uh, Jonathan was the author of the translation of Psalms into Aramaic. And I said this is a good enough place to, as any to introduce the idea of Enoch as Metatron, the great scribe. Hanoch served in truth, Kushta, that's kissed in Arabic, uh, before the Lord, and behold, he was not with the sojourners of the earth. For he was withdrawn, if Nagid Vesalik Larakia, and he was raised up into heaven by the word, the Memar, by a word. Memra is a word that sometimes translates the uh, idea. Philo uses the word logos, uh, which is a very Christian sounding term, but the Targum uses it all the time. The uh, Targum Onkelos uses Memra or Memar. Memar uh, Deshema, the, the word of God. And uh, his name was called Metatron, the Safra Rabbah, the great scribe, whatever that means. 
There are three Talmudic references to Metatron. None of them connect Hanoch with Metatron, but it's interesting to look at them, and that's the next place we need to go. Yeah, in, in the Islamic sources, it mentions that Idris, he's the first pe- a human to write with the pen. So, yeah, that's, that's, yeah. this is, these things are quite, we'll see what may be a background to that source, why the people who first heard the Quran thought that made sense in a couple of minutes. But I'm going to take a, uh, you might say, a trip through two of the three mentions of Metatron in the Talmud because they're important and they don't really relate to Hanukkah, but it's important to note that they don't because there's a certain amount of discussion about it. This is from a treatise called Chagiga, and I've gotten the material from Sepharia, which in which the material in bold translates the Talmud. The material in blue is a reference, and in Sepharia, those references are live links. Uh, they might even be here. It looks like they are live links. So the, oh no, it's not, it's a file. It won't, it won't actually work in the PDF, <clears throat> but they do in Safaria. And so it says, Acher kitzetz benetiot, alava katuv omer. Acher chopped down the, the saplings. And uh, the interpreter says, the, the commentator says, becoming a heretic. With regard to him, the verse states, do not let your mouth bring your flesh to guilt. And now they're going to explain what the verse means. What was it that led him to heresy? My, what was it? Chazam mitatron, v'tyehiva le reshuta lemetav lemichtav zechvata d'Israel. So he saw Metatron, who was granted permission to sit, this is to sit in front of God, and Milamichtav to Katav to write, Zachavata, these are the Zakut, the Z- um, in Arabic you write Zakut, but you pronounce Zakat, uh, the merits of Israel. In Hebrew, the merits are not only financial uh, of Israel, but you can well imagine that if we're talking about zakat, we'd be talking about writing them down, especially if they were financial. In Arabic, zakat is used primarily to indicate giving religiously ordained um, percentage of your wealth in charity. And the Jews know that we just had Yisker where we give charity also, bishut avot in the for the memory of our ancestors and of uh, our especially of our parents. Amar, and he said, "Gemira dilmala lahave la yeshiva velo taharut velo ora velo ipui shema chas v'shalom shnei shnei rishiyote." And he says, "You know, we know that there's no sitting and no competition, no turning one's back. All face of divine presence." And he translates this, no lethargy. Since he saw somebody sitting in addition to God, God sitting on the throne and Metatron sitting as a scribe, he says, maybe there are two powers in heaven. And that's how he went astray. Anyway, Metatron got punished. He got hit with 60 rods of fire. And this word, pulse denura, has a very interesting background. The Pulsa de Nura, Simcha, you probably have heard about the Pulsa de Nura, right? Uh, is there any material there? I lost my place for a second. Hold on. The Kabbalistic curse. Pulsa de yeah. Nura is a curse. Yeah. It's a curse, right. Uh-huh. It was cast yeah. on uh, Yitzhak Rabin and uh, Ariel Sharon. Yeah, that's right. So here we see the a Talmudic source about it. So uh, this Pulse de Nura, whatever it means, uh, was a very wicked curse that caused the death of human beings. It probably did not cause the death of the angel Metatron, the way it was understood by our Talmudic uh, authors. But the idea being that Metatron was hit by the Pulse de Nura, and not only one of them, Shittin, 60 of them. Right. Amarle, he said to him, 
my Tama, what's the reason? When you saw Elisha ben Avuya, you didn't stand before him. That way, Elisha would have known that you were not God. Um, in any case, uh, Elisha, I'm sorry, uh, Metatron erased the merits of Elisha ben Abuya and caused him to stum stumble. And then there was a divine voice that went out. I'm just going to briefly tell you the end of this particular story. Elisha ben Abuya said, well, now that I know that there's more than one deity in heaven, I'm going to go out and enjoy the world. And the word that's used in Hebrew is um, uh, tarbut ra'a. He went out to bad, uh, bad culture. Tarbia is the Arabic, tarbut ra'a. Bad tarbia. And uh, so he finds a prostitute and he pulls up radishes on the Sabbath, gave it to her, and she actually gives him the name. She says, Vihavla, I'm sorry, Amra Acherhu. She said, No, this is somebody else. He's, he's become a different, and that's the name that stuck. The passage in Sanhedrin is not all that, uh, well, the passage in Sanhedrin is very relevant to the further development. Uh, the one that is in uh, Chagiga is far more important in terms of Jewish mysticism. Elisha was one of four rabbis who went to heaven. And he's always cited for the problems that you might have if you engage in mystic speculation. Sanhedrin is another tractate of the Talmud. And here we introduce Metatron with the idea of my name is in him as an angel who led Israel and led of some of the, uh, some of the ancestors of the Israelites. Uh, this has to do with heretics. That's the context Rav Nachman says. Somebody needs to know how to respond to heretics, like Rav Edith says. And the Gemara says, here's a story. A heretic said to Rav Edith, it is written, and Moses says, come up to the Lord. It should have said, come up to me, because Moses is quoting God, and God says, come up to me. What does it say? The Lord. It should have said, come to me. And says this term, when it says the Lord, here does not mean God as we usually think so to, but the angel Metatron, <coughs> Sheshmo Kishem Rabo, his name is like the name of his master. And I put M in capitals, master meaning God. As it is written, and the text only gives you the last part of the verse. In Exodus 23, for my name is in him, Kishmi Bekirbo, which the interpreter here is saying, the, uh, this is Rav Nachman, or Rav Idik, being quoted by Rav Nachman, says this first tells you that there's some sort of angel on high, and his name is like the name of his master, and this explains a lot of problems. So the heretic says to him, if so, the angel is the same as God. We should worship both of them. This was the problem of Acher. Rabbi Edit says, Al Tamer, and he understands, don't replace him or don't rebel against God. So he says, if so, why do I need the clause? He will not pardon your transgression. Rabbi Edit said, we believe that if we that we did not accept the angel even as a guide, as it is written, we said to him, "If your presence go not with me, raise up, uh, raise us up, not up from here." This is a version when God is about to destroy the Israelite people with the golden calf. Moses told God, having Metatron go with the people or some angel. A farvanka, which is a Persian word, I think. Actually, Zainab, you should know. Farvanka, does this make any sense to you? Farva, how do you, can you say it again? Uh, here is how it's transliterated. Farvanka. And the B is just B. Yeah, if I one. Farvanka might be the, the Farsi. Does this sense resonate with you as a guide or any kind of a... Yeah, uh, as, as a something like guidance yeah because parva means you need to be warned and something like that no, parva, so, yeah it makes sense i think this is a word that came into the aramaic from persian so again here 
we have the end of the story saying Moses is telling God, no way, we don't want to have someone as a messenger or a guide or whatever it is. Now, I'm following some uh, material by Gershom Sholem and um, Moshe Egel and a younger scholar whose name I should remember, but I don't, Shil Paz, who's at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. And Paz actually has a long thing where he talks about shaliach, a messenger, and the Greek apostolos. And this is related to an idea of even in the New Testament of whether or not there's going to be a some some follower of Jesus who will lead the way. And um, in Islam, we have the idea that that's a reference to Ahmad or to Muhammad. So it's actually quite interesting for our discussion. I didn't copy it. We'd never be done within an hour. I have more material than I possibly can, uh, can use. Yes. Okay, let me just make sure I have the right material. This is Rav Nachman, the heretic. And then I have the Targum Jonathan, just as one of the many examples, and the Sefer Zerubbabel. Uh, the angel of Metatron is Michael. Michael played a role as a guy throughout Israel's history, and his, his name is linked with his masters. I'll read the Hebrew, and I will transliterate it. This is com coming from a book that was published late 19th century, I believe, Otsar Midrashim. It's now available on Safari, which is nice. No translation there. And I'm going to translate it orally. By Yosef Metatron Malach by Yomer Li. So Metatron continues the angel, and he tells me, "Ani hu Metatron, I am Metatron." And the abbreviation here for those people who read Hebrew is of interest. I found something that uses the gematria, the the numeric value. Oh, uh, Muhammad, you probably know this. Mim is how much? Huh? Mim. How much is mim? Meme? Yeah. In numbers. I have no clue. Abjad no. Hawaz. No. Yeah. Didn't you learn Abjad Hawaz at one point? No, no. Uh, too bad. So meme yeah, is we 40. Have, we don't have it at the school. In the school. <laughs> yeah, well, you should. Abjad Hawaz, uh, one, two, three, four, and so on. Uh, and Ted in Hebrew is worth nine. So this is 40 plus nine plus nine, 58. And I think I have it here. If I don't, I will try to remember to tell you at the end what the reference is. So Metatron said, I am Metatron, the uh, minister of the interior. And my name is Michael. And God put me over, actually, I'm supplying God. By Yisimeni, somebody put me over his people and of the uh, Ohavav, the people who love him. And I am the one who led Abraham throughout all of the land of Canaan. And I am the one who redeemed Isaac. And I, um, I struggled, uh, I fought with Jacob at the Jabbok River. And I led the uh, people of Israel for 40 years in the wilderness in the name of God. And I am the one who appeared to Joshua uh, right after he crossed the Jordan River in, Gal in Gilgal. And I am the one who is the na same name as my master, and my name is within me. Again, a reference to that verse. And Targum Jonathan has something very similar to the Sefer Zerubbabel. The Sefer Zerubbabel, despite the fact it was published a long time ago, is an apocryphal work that really doesn't know very much. Um, Targum Jonathan also has a reference. Michael, the Prince of Wisdom, said to Moses on the seventh day of the month, come up before the Lord and worship as a distance. And again, we have the reference of Michael, the Prince of Wisdom, very similar. And uh, there you go. Uh, then he asked about the book of the books of Enoch. Traditionally, we talk about three books of Enoch, and I have references from all three of them. I think only third Enoch actually has a Hebrew version that survived. Uh, Enoch 2, I think, only existed in um, uh, Ethiopic. Uh, I don't know whether it had a Greek version. And I should know this stuff better than I did. I complained to my 
mysticism class, and one of the things I found this past summer is that I thought I knew more than I did. When I began to prepare, I realized how large my the cracks are in my training. In any case, the books of Enoch clearly were known to the late antique rabbis in Palestine, in, in the land of Israel, and in Babylonia. Uh, they probably were even known to the Dead Sea Scrolls people or refer to stories that were known to them yeah. uh, and may even have some memories of stories that circulated among the uh, ancient Israelites that were cut out of the Bible. I say this very guardedly because normally I would say that you really cannot assume that there's an awful lot of that material and that it's much more likely that the books of Enoch that talk about Enoch going to heaven depend on the biblical text as it was understood rather than preserving material that was not preserved in the Bible. But again, that's my approach. And here I have to say, I saw some people who raised it. This is a possibility. And, uh, you know, it could be. I don't, I don't want to overstate the possibility, but I do want to mention this a possibility. So here we have Enoch transfigured, clothed in majesty in words that may suggest to those familiar with biblical texts to be an awful lot like the image of God, clothed in majesty like an angel. We also have a scribe, but it's important to note that Metatron is not part of the equation here. Um, you can read this very quickly. One of the things I found interesting, let's see if it was preserved in the PDF. So I think you can see my, my screen. It says scriptures.lvs.org. And this particular version uh, has a lot of references to Latter-day Saint scriptures, including the books of, the, of Moses, which are in the Pearl of Great Price, in case you're interested in such things. So Enoch like the rabbis who went to heaven, like Muhammad who went to heaven and learned about prayer, uh, Enoch goes to heaven. In this particular version, there are more than seven heavens. The eighth, ninth, and tenth heaven are above the seven everyday heavens that everyone knows about. So if this one is called Aravot, and I saw the appearance of the Lord's face. And I saw the Lord's first, but the face is inevitable, ineffable, marvelous, and awful here, meaning full of awe and terrible. How am I to tell of the Lord's unspeakable being and so on? And he talks about the cherubim and the seraphim and their singing. I felt prone, bowed down to the Lord. And uh, then the Lord with his lips say to me, have courage, Enoch, do not fear, arise and stand before my face, before my face is like um, Min Kubli, uh, in front of me um, for eternity. And then Micah lifted me up and led me to before the face of God. I bowed down to the Lord and uh, then uh, the glorious ones bowed down. Let Enoch go according to your word. The, the Lord said to Michael, take Enoch out of his earthly garments and anoint him with my sweet ornament, put on the garments of my glory. So Enoch here is invested with the robes of God. My mysticism class looked at some of the material in Ezekiel and Isaiah, which uh, talk about the robes of God. And here we have Enoch, a man, you might say, transfigured. And we see that Michael does this, so he summons one of his arch archangels, and then bring out the books from my storehouse and a read of quick writing and give it to Enoch. So in this particular source, we don't have Enoch inventing writing, but Enoch is given the, pel the pen by the angel at the divine command and uh, is taught to write. Dr. Ward, I have a question about the uh, the robes. Is it kind of like, uh, I think Adam Harishon had a, had some kind of vestments. Is it like that, or is it thought to be understood as like a spiritual garment? Uh, I have no idea. One of the things that it doesn't really quite bother me is that I have never gone up to heaven to see God. And, uh, 
<laughs> and therefore, <laughs> I don't know that I want to speculate what either what they actually are or what the people of who wrote the books of Enoch thought they were. My guess is that they both believe. Uh, look, I can tell you the solution that came to dominate among Muslims who had some of the same questions. I like the solution a lot. The Muslim, uh, the Ashari tradition, on the one hand, wanted to assert the literal reality of a lot of these things. So when they talk about the balance, and when they talk about the hand and the foot of God, they say, this is not a metaphor, this is real. But they also say, Muhammad, you know what they say, what the Asherites say? Yeah, they say, Laysa Kamisli Shay was Samuel al Basir. So if God says he has a hand, then he has a hand, but it's not like our hand. So right. you're going to have a description for it. Right. And, and they say also, you, yeah, it's not going to benefit you to know how it looks like. Yeah, the Lakaif, we don't ask how. Because yeah. that almost sounds like the Tanya a bit. <laughs> yeah, well, Tanya is part of the same mystical tradition. Okay, and then all the things I have told you, we have written, sit and write all the souls of mankind, however many of them are born. And so we have in the book of Enoch, we have the notion of Enoch writing everything. And this is similar to Metatron, but in this particular book, they're not the same. Whatever you want to say, scholars who's, who are more specialists than I am, debate whether the Enoch and the Metatron traditions are the same. Exodus 23 is, I am sending the angel before you to guard you on the way to bring you to the place. And this is the verse, since my name is in him, it should have gone before. The apocalypse of Abraham is the next source. And you guys can get this. I've sent, I think most of the people who are actually here tonight are on my mailing list. I've sent you the uh, handout. You can also get it from Dr. Seth Ward, D-R-S-E-T-H-W-A-R-D dot uh, wordpress.com where I posted it to if you want it. And you can email me. So you can, you can read this if you want. Um, but here in the Apocalypse of Abraham, we have another similar character called Yaol, the editor of the Apocalypse of Abraham, suggests that uh, Yaol really is supposed to be the divine four-letter name with the L added to it, but that is that solves a problem of God appearing to Abraham with Isaac, God appearing to Abraham before Isaac is born, and the kind of differential, is it actually God who appears or is it an angel who appears? And again, this goes back to the Apocalypse of Abraham. A fun fact, the Apocalypse of Abraham may be the earliest source for the story of Abraham and the idols, which is not in the Torah, but it is in the Quran and many other locations. And here we have Abraham traveling to Mount Horeb to offer the sacrifice, which is interesting because in the Bible text, Abraham goes to Moriah and not to Horeb. In any case, uh, I copied this from a PDF. There are some problems with formatting. I'm sorry from it. Here's the Enoch, the first Enoch. And this is very interesting. My Christian students or students interested in Christian sources will find it interesting that Enoch has this idea of son of man. I think that based on the fact that he talks about Atik Yomin, the ancient of days, and Enoch doesn't occur in Aramaic or in Hebrew, so I'm not sure, but I can't imagine that the Atik Yomin, the ancient of days, or the head of days is not what's being described here. And so the Son of Man probably relates to a verse in Daniel about something like a Son of Man coming on the clouds. And this gets to be very important in later on mysticism. Sefer Hechalot we have in Hebrew, and it's sometimes called Third Enoch. And in Sefer Hechalot, the only source that was preserved in Hebrew, Metatron does become identical with Enoch, translated to heaven, 
and he's translated to heaven at the time of the deluge, which doesn't exactly mesh up with the numbers, but the idea being that Hanukh was like Noah, Hanukh was a worthwhile and um, deserving person, and God's solution for Noah was the ark, but God's solution for Metatron was to bring him up to heaven. Amar Rabbi Yishmael ba'ota sha'a sha'alti et Metatron malach sar ha'panim, amar kilo ma'ashimcha, amar li yesh li shivim shemot. So at that time I asked Metatron and said to him, why are you called by um, <clears throat> Sarapanim, means the um, prince of the uh, interior. And he says, I have 70 names. And they are 70 names for the 70 nations of the world. I'm translating the Hebrew. And aval malchi kore oti nar, but my king calls me nar, youth. And then Rabbi Ishmael says, Why are you called by the name of your creator, Beshivim Shemot? By 70 names, and you are the biggest of them, and the greatest of all the angels. And then he goes on, I'm skipping down a little bit, he says, I am Enoch, the son of Jared. And you can see in Hebrew, the editor put this in large letters. And he goes on, he tells the whole story when the generation of the flood sinned and they were confounded in their deeds. And maybe the time when Enoch went to heaven is when the generation began to be um, guilty. And Noah was able to teach them for a generation, but they did not change their ways. When I say there are parallel text here, what I text here, what I mean is that the English language edition that I had had three different versions, none of which are exactly the same. Actually, I'm not sure that none of them are exactly the same, but they're not exactly the same as the Hebrew version that I had. He had different manuscripts, and this is from Surat Maryam. Um, Muhammad has already recited the verse for us. There are two verses. And the trans, the tafsir here is from Jalalain. The, uh, the, I think Jalalain, this is still, I don't remember whether this is Jalaladin. Jalaladin or Suyuti. I think this is Suyuti already because it's chapter 19 already. Uh, there were two of them. I think Suyuti started I, I never remember. I get them mixed up. I always have to look this up. In any case, one of the Jalalain says uh, Idris was Noah's great grandfather, and he was a truthful one, a prophet. Uh, that's from the Arabic, Sadiqan uh, Nabiyan. And we raise him to a high station. He is alive in the fourth or sixth or seventh heaven, and he is in paradise into which he was admitted after he was made to experience death and then brought back to life. So in this particular version, remember how we said, did Enoch die? He both experienced death and he was brought back to life and he has not come back from heaven. Now, my uh, mysticism... The, the story of Isra, when the prophet ascended to heaven, he met Idris. And yeah. there are two versions of that story. One of them said he met him in the fourth heaven and the other one said in the sixth heaven. So. Right. And Jalal Adin knows about another version where he met him in the seventh heaven. Oh. Whatever it's worth. I couldn't find translations of the Zohar and it's close to six o'clock. So I want to look very briefly just to tell you that it exists. Rabbeinu Bachia was in Spain in the 1300s in a generation that was already familiar with Zoharic Kabbalistic thought. So he uh, thinks that Hanok's years were 365 years and, and that the Bible is telling us that he was an astronomer. He knew the solar year and that he was familiar with the power of the sun and realized that this was due to celestial input and remained active within the sun. This sounds an awful lot like philosophic mysticism in those days. Uh, Rambam, Maimonides would say, you look at the sun and you realize the sun was created by God and is the source of all of our energy on earth. 
and that God is the source of the sun, and so on and so forth. Okay? And uh, the original light, which came from God, is drawn into the sun, and the righteous person, Hanoch, merited to enjoy it. And the Torah is telling this because it uses the word Vayahi, and another place where it uses Vayahi is Vayahi or, and there was light. So the fact that the, it says Vayahi, and it was in the singular, is to remind us of Vayahi or. Very interesting. And then it says we have another Vayahi. Moses, when he was out of Mount Sinai, was granted illumination of the Torah. And he descended the second time, his forehead emitted rays of physical light. Hanoch walked with God. Rabbeinu Bachia is giving us walking with God and tells us that Hanoch and Noah and Abraham realized that there was a, a significant power. I'm not going, you can look at the, the five luminaries and the seven lights and uh, so on and so forth. I'm not going to talk about any of this because I simply don't, I want to finish. I told you that if we had time, we'd come back to the 58. So Hanoch, uh, the first two letters of his name, Chenun, are 58. That is the first three letters of Metatron. So Bachia sees Hanoch as being related to the angel, which is second only to God, really. He gained sufficient insight so that his name reflected these intellectual accomplishments. As a result of these insights, his body and soul underwent changes by becoming unified. As a result, there was no need for his body to die, and God was able to remove him from the earth without the body having to be left behind. Now, this reminds me of an awful lot of mystic stories. I don't know that many Jewish stories, but there are stories about Rabbi Al-Anawiyah, that that's what happened to her. And some of the Sufis and Muhammad, you'll forgive me, uh, with Baha and Fana, that uh, they, they left behind their physical body, having achieved only the spiritual body. People who believe this and talk about it publicly, in Baghdad, they got executed uh, because they had not left their physical body and they were able to be killed. In any case, Bache offers his solution to our problem. I'm sorry that this skips back. Okay, and then the Enenu, and he ceased to be. <clears throat> the sages of Jerusalem Talmud interpret it as a combination of El Ayin, an acknowledgement of something. I did not look up the Yerushalmi. I'm sorry. I'm going to end with Sefer Abahir. Uh, Moshe Idel ended his article uh, on Metatron and Enoch, quoting Sefer Abahir. He didn't quote the entire thing. Rabbi Rechumai said, the path to life is the rebuke that disciplines, a verse from the biblical book of Proverbs, and that this teaches us that whoever deals regularly with Maaseh Breshit and Maaseh Merkava, the act of creation and the act of chariot, can only fail. Here's how he says in Hebrew, E Efshar Shalo Yichashel. It cannot be except that he will fail. As it is said, And the translator that I found said, These are things that no person can endure without failing. Yeah. Let this ruin be under your hand, from Isaiah. These are things nobody can really stand up to. No one can endure. But except that it will happen that he will fail. He comes back to the verse in Proverbs. The Torah tells him, here is your rebuke of discipline. Sefer Abahir ends this particular paragraph saying, however, the verse in Proverbs says, Derech Hayim, the path to life, and is going to say how wonderful the path to life is. This has to be with a capital L, the, the, the real life, the truth that is greater than truth, life that is greater than life. 
whoever wishes to gain the path of life, let him endure the rebuke of discipline. Uh, here's my takeaway from Sefer Bahir. Sefer Bahir is uh, the book of clarity, which is not at all clear. The book of clarity is telling us you will not understand these things. You will fail to make sense of them. However, the path to life is through failure to understand this material, the struggle to understand it inside itself, the goal. So I hope for the past hour, uh, we have struggled to understand some things. Uh, what happened when it said that Enoch uh, was not? We saw that some people believe that Enoch um, died and went to heaven. Some people thought he just died and that was that. Uh, some people thought that Enoch was translated to heaven and became a divine scribe that wrote down the words of heaven. Uh, later on in Jewish life, there was an idea, it's called Gilgul Mishamot. In Hebrew, it's called Tanasuch in, Ara in some Arabic, um, that um, uh, Enoch was a Gilgul of Pinchas, it was a Gilgul of Elijah, and there might have been other people who who had the same kind of an idea. And uh, there you go. I don't know the answer. What I do know is that I had found it fascinating to read all this material, and I hope you enjoyed it. And I can stick around and answer questions or have some discussions. I hope I didn't lose anybody in the discussion. I wasn't lost. I have a couple of questions. Like in the first, um, in the beginning of the PDF, you had um... Uh, Voracious Five, and, and um, in between Ha Elohim, there was a period. And I'm wondering if yeah, I just know. added that in case you printed it and wanted to throw it out. Okay. Um, so another yeah, one. That's because when I put a hyphen or a space, I had problems. Okay, that makes sense. Um, also, you cited uh, Sefer Hayasher. Is, is that the book of Jasher, the one that's called the book of Jasher in English, or is it a different book? It is the version that's in Safaria, and um, rather than relying on my memory, which is not always so good, let me open up Safaria. I was kind of wondering, like, there's been a big push for people to, I mean, I don't want to say debunk, it's, you know, like, if you look at anything critically, it, it you know, it's, it's understandable. So the Sefer Yashar that's in Safaria is not the one that's mentioned in scripture. Okay. It is named after it. It says that it was composed in late Middle Ages Spain in 1300, which means it's post Kabbalistic. It's attributed to Ray Benu Tom, which would make it Spain, uh, France, and pre Kabbal. Well, frankly speaking, probably non Kabbalistic. Rabbeinu Tom was during the period when the Kalanimuses and so on were involved in the Hasidic movement of the Middle Ages, but he was a Tosafist and the grandson of Rashi and probably not at all involved in it. I remember as a kid going through Zerachi Hayavani and um, Yona Gerundi and so on, and what it says over here, it's similar in substance to ideas that were present among the Hasidei Ashkenaz, which is a good reason to assume that it was, for my, to my mind, that it probably was not written by uh, Rabbeinu Tam. I don't know where the editors of Sefer Yashar got the idea that it was Spain in the 1300s. The most likely location is Torah Emet or Sewerkholm one or the other uh, said that it was. And somebody may or may not have done the research. I hope that's not too erudite to bore you with all those details. No, not at all. Um, I, I have another question too, because you mentioned when they, they, what they translated as son of man, um, and you tie that to Atik Yomin. I mean, would it be too much of a stretch to maybe see that as like a like a conceptualization for Mashiach Shabbador? I think so. One of the reasons, my students sometimes ask me, why don't I know more about the book of Enoch, the books of Enoch? And one of the possible reasons is that 
the son of man notion became so prominent among the minim, the heretics. Now, I'm not going to suggest that the minim, the heretics of one of the two Talmudic passages, were Christians. But the son of man notion became so prominent among them that the rabbis ditched the books of Enoch because one of them had this idea that Enoch became um, Baranasha, I think, is the is the version in Sefer Daniel. And again, I don't know that that's true. It is true that I've seen people who argue that. Um, I suspect that this is part of messianic speculation. And one of the texts that I looked at connected of this whole business with the Mephiroth as well. But I cannot say that, I can't say that this is for sure. Hmm. Where do you lean? I guess, um, I mean, I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but I mean, you've obviously studied it a lot more. I mean, like, do you kind of lean towards uh, Hanukkah getting translated or, or becoming, is, is there any precedent for that? Or do you just kind of take it all and say it's interesting? Uh, my reading of the verse of the paragraph from Sefer Bahir is as close as possible to where I truly stand on this. I don't want to speculate about translating human beings to heaven. I don't know that we are required um, as a matter of religious faith to understand that the meaning of the text that we have in the Bible is that Enoch went to heaven. We might be required by rabbinic understanding to understand things like Lo uh, Gedi Mo, don't uh, boil a goat in its mother's milk in order to separate milk, but we are not required for Agadah to understand that Enoch went to heaven and still lives there. Uh, however, Sefer Bahir says that even though we will fail to understand this, this is my reading of it, in the attempt to understand what the texts are all about, we perceive the pathway to life. Uh, Frank, I know this does not answer your question. It gives but, thought, so that's, you know, it, it's struggling with these texts and trying to figure out what they mean, not necessarily what I believe is correct, but what they mean is how we achieve some sort of a pathway to life. And I do really think that this is, you know, part of our goal is to wrestle with these texts. You know, uh, I have no idea whether Idris really is in heaven, uh, whether he's in the fourth or the sixth or seventh heaven or so. But reading the Quran, if I were a Muslim, and even if I'm not a Muslim, is part of how we get closer to God, whatever that means for us. I have a question. Please. Uh, there was a, a reference to something from a of Abraham. Um, it started with an A in the, of Abraham, and there was a quote yeah. from it. Apocalypse of Abraham. Yeah. Is that a book? It is a book. Okay. Thank you. Anyway. And you can find it online. And if you look at the text, which I believe I sent you, uh, you can even find a link there, that which ought to work. And if it doesn't work, Write me and I will send you another version of that with a link that does work. Okay, thank you. You know what, we're talking about books of, uh, like I guess attributed to Abraham. Um, I had heard of one a while back and I haven't been able to find it. It was a rabbi, I think he was conservative, but you know, like not that that really matters. Um, he was quoting something about like the seven worlds of Abraham or something like that. And I was wondering if maybe you, you know. No idea. Sometimes uh, Dr. Google can find these things very quickly. Yeah, I've been trying to find it again. It's been, I mean, that was what, like maybe three years ago. Um, I just thought maybe like, you know, because there's a lot of, key, you know, you, you think, oh, yeah, I know that book. I know that book. I read that book. And then there's always another one where like, whoa, you know, I, I didn't, I'd never even heard of this one. Like there's one about like the staff of Moshe and um, or the rod of Moses. Yeah, there's actually there was a legend about Hanoch and the staff of Moses also that Hanoch was responsible for writing Yitzhak Hadash Be'achav as a scribe on the staff of Moses, 
some you may you may have heard this at, um, as a uh, midrash that might have been told by Chabad. And some people associate this with Hanukkah also, and somehow or other it uh, came to Moses, um, and that was well, to Aaron and Moses, and that was how the miracles were done. Uh, there's so much midrashim on this, like, you know, that, I don't, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> you can, I, I'm kind of sitting back and trying to understand everything that you've said today, but it's, uh, it's extremely confusing to me, the way you've gone about this, but that's just, maybe it's just me. I, I take a much more straightforward <laughs> approach to what's done. I think that gracious Rabbi kind of clears up the thing within I can, you know, kind of done but I mean it's I don't find it as interesting as you as you do perhaps to, well I, I wouldn't have been interested in it except that my students asked me about who Metatron is and how whether Metatron is related to Enoch and I don't know that Brashid Rabba clears that up well it doesn't clear up that point but it clears up who Enoch is so therefore it clears up that point in a certain sense so okay. but, you know it's it's an interesting intellectual exercise, but maybe nothing more than that from my point of view. <laughs> so, you mean it clears up who he is, like from the line of Yered? Wait, what was that? Are you are you saying it clears up the point of uh, Hanif being uh, uh, son of Yered? I think it clear. Yeah, well, not only that, but I think it, it clears up the point that uh, that Inik actually died and went and that, before his time, and and I. I, I hold with this view with Enoch that he died that you know he, he's kind of like in a sense almost like Noah in a certain sense and that he was probably at the time you know it appears at least from what Rashi's comment is and from the Midrash that he was very righteous but he did not have the ability uh, just because of his own way he was you know and dealt with things that he didn't have the ability to turn other people towards a more righteous way of living and so therefore, uh, you know, God, rather than see him go to the quote unquote dark side, the evil side, you know, took him before his time and said, you know, I, I'm going to save you from, you know, having to be uh, walking at the path of evil, you know. I mean, even we see this with Noah, you know, that we even, even when we talk about Noah, you know, God picks Noah, but why? He goes, well, and our relative terms, you're the most righteous, but you're not righteous as if you were really a truly righteous person. But compared to everybody else, you're the least of the scoundrels, so you're it. I need somebody. <laughs> kind of like getting MVP if you were the least, uh, the, the player with the least errors. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's not, like you're, it's, not you're, it's not you're not you're not the goat. You're not the greatest of all time. So uh, <laughs> I like to I like to remind people that scripture doesn't say not the greatest of all time and that's a debate between different commentaries right. on, on the text and we can give precedence to Rashi who reads it that way in some of the other Midrashim but others yeah. don't and a lot of the material that we looked at today puts Enoch, Noah, Abraham and Moses together in one basket mm -hmm. uh, even though it doesn't necessarily say they are all the same so you know that's another way of looking at it uh, Again, I don't have an answer. I think spending time with this is my answer for it. Uh, I will take one more question, one more discussion. After that, um, Frank, this is another answer also. Time for Mincha, soon after this. Or as Zainab would say, uh, I have a few minutes before sundown for the afternoon prayer. Wow. <laughs> so... So Jesus said he was the son of man, right? And the word of son of man is in like Christian things. Uh, rather than debating exactly what Jesus said, what I suggested was that it may very well be that the reason why the books of Enoch were not preserved in Hebrew texts for the most part was because of that reference and because of a rejection of the meaning. And I showed you a passage from Talmud which we have a, uh, a mean, a heretic, and sometimes the mean refer to Christians. So it could be. And that, that's the best I can do. I didn't say that I find this compelling uh, beyond the fact that it could be. Interesting.
Is it possible to sit in on uh, your your uh, Sufism and Kabbalah class through Zoom? Tuesday nights, the same Zoom. Just join, come on, come on in. Uh, what time it, on Tuesday nights? Six to eight. Six to eight. Okay. Six to eight thirty. Six to eight thirty. Okay. Have a good time, everybody. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. It's always, Zainab, it's always great to see you. Thank you. The same. Thank you so uh, much. I'm so thrilled that we're still in touch. I uh, am yeah, the same. I feel the same. Thank you. And Frank, I'm, it's great that uh, Zoom allows us to continue to be in touch. So Thank that's you. great. Likewise. Yeah. Thank you. Laila Tosa. Donna, Mimi. It's great seeing you. Bye bye. Bye, Dr. Ward. Bye, Dr. Ward. Have a good night, everyone.